Welcome to the first keynote speaker of our Halley Ford School of Graduate Studies Symposium. At PNCA, our gra graduate programs are inter interdisciplinary and collaborative, fostering independent work through individual mentorship, as well as collective making and community engagement. For those of us joining virtually and in person, we begin by acknowledging that Portland rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin Kalapoya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. We are committed to recognizing the ongoing relationships that exist between indigenous peoples and these places. This symposium will consider how contemporary artists render algorithmic harms visible and imagine speculative futures optimized for just outcomes. The event, which continues tomorrow, will facilitate conversations on the ethical, environmental, political, social, and economic impacts of artificial intelligence and machine learning for artists, de designers, makers, writers, researchers, and cultural workers. Thank you to everyone who organized and contributed to this event, Megan McKissick of Make Think Code, our graduate symposium fellows, Heaven Lee Carey and Michelle Bremer, to Rory for tech support, and to Shauna Lipton, my colleague and co-planner. I will now welcome Dalen to introduce our keynote speaker. Dalen is a dual MA MFA candidate in critical studies and visual studies. They are interested in subverting the capitalist co-option of tools for liberatory play and in the use of interactive art, particularly IRL installation at Indian video games for radical storytelling, learning and healing. Thank you. I am super honored to be introducing Amelia Winger Bearskin, as I am personally very excited about the really radical, immersive, narrative ways that she co-creates with both humans and non-human systems to push for us to, and these are her words, articulate the values we want to see in technology. Amelia is an artist who innovates with artificial intelligence in ways that make a positive impact in our community and the environment. She is a Banks Family Preeminence Endowed Chair and Associate Professor of Artificial Intelligence and the Arts at the Digital Worlds Institute at the University of Florida. She is the inventor of Honor Native Sky, a project for the US Department of Arts and Culture Honor Native Land Initiative. She founded Wampum Codes, which is, which is both an award-winning podcast and an ethical framework for software development based on indigenous values of co-creation. She and her work have received honors, awards, and recognition by numerous institutions and, and universities, including MIT, Stanford, the MacArthur Foundation, and the Sundance Institute. The nonprofit she founded, Interactive Digital Environments Alliance New Rochelle, in partnership with the New Rochelle Mayor's Office, won the 2018 $1 million Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge for their VR AR citizen, citizen toolkit to help the community co-design their city. In 2018, she was awarded the 100K Alternative Realities Prize for her virtual reality project from Engadget and the Verizon Media. Amelia is Haudenosaunee of the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma Deer Clan. Looking to the way the Iroquois, Iroquois Confederacy was built, Amelia has said, anything that I'm doing now is the re result of seven generations behind me. Anything I do will have a lasting impact on the seven generations ahead of me which I think is just really perfect for everything that we've been thinking about with the symposium. So again, I am honored to introduce Amelia Winger Bearskin. Thank you so much. It is such a joy and a pleasure to be with each of you at such a, um, you know, a special time in your growth and um, and in your community. I know a lot of, um, I, I have been to PNCA a couple of times and done a couple of performances uh, throughout my career, and it's a very special place to me, so I'm very excited to be with you today. Um, I would definitely ask that if at any time there's any kind of technical difficulty, just unmute and let me know, and <laughs> otherwise I'll continue to bumble long and not know. Um, I'm going to do that lovely thing where we share our screens. <laughs> so get ready. All right. So if I don't hear anything, then I'll assume that it worked. <laughs> um, all right. So thank you so much. I'm Amelia winker Thank you for that wonderful um, introduction. Uh, it was a very, very kind. Thank you. Um, so I do a little thing called a topic roundup. Um, so at the end of my talk, I'm going to let you know. And then you can take a photo of the screen with 
the cell phone that you have with you, um, uh, any camera, or you, if you're at home, um, you can take a screenshot. So I do this so that you don't have to feel like you need to take notes or look at your phone and scribble something. Of course, you can look at your phone and you know chat with your friends or whatever, but don't worry about me. I've got you. You can just sit back and relax, enjoy the show, as they say. And when we have these topic roundup slides, I'll let you know, and then you can just snap it. And if you want to Google anything I say later or uh, reach out to me or participate in any of these projects I'm about to tell you about, um, you'll know when I say it's the topic roundup slide. All right. So um, I have a little video that uh, Unfinished Live made, and I'm going to share it with you today. I got into coding because I wanted to do things that I couldn't do by myself. And m being able to collaborate with machines meant that I could do things that I do poorly faster, and then I could do things that machines do poorly uh, better. <laughs> The first place I started performing was with my mom, who was a storyteller from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. I would play the Iroquois rattle and drum while she told stories. I then became a classically trained opera singer. I started composing and directing and making more and more emerging technology mixed with live performance and opera, and kind of ended up in museums. Nowadays, a lot of different media, AR and VR are interactive media to tell stories, co-creating with other types of non-human systems. As an artist or as an activist, I look at the way that the Iroquois Confederacy was built. We said that anything that I'm doing now is the result of seven generations behind me. Anything I do will have a lasting impact on the seven generations ahead of me. We use stories as a way of taking values and ethics and putting them into the core of innovation. I started looking at the media landscape we have now. How do I take information and encode it for future generations? A lot of my work is really about creating an ethical framework for software development and design and articulation of values and ethics within technologies with the understanding that we need to future-proof these. There's a notion that the technology we've created now has outrun us. No one knows how to regulate it. We accidentally opened this Pandora's box and we can't get it all back inside. But actually, we can choose to use technology to build a more just world, a more equitable world. We can demand that. We can say that we want algorithms that are human-centered, that are for our environment, that are pro-democracy. We can articulate the values we want to see in technology and communicate those to seven generations in the future. What do we want to achieve with the culture and social network that we're creating? All right, so I've been thinking a lot about the name of your series, uh, Speculative Futures and Speculative Design. Um, so I, I would like to say this little statement. <laughs> Don't colonize the future. So colonial mindset, what is that? Well, it's like I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll take it. And I take what will benefit my own political or material interests, but I'm unconcerned with the effect that it will have on the people that I take it from. What's wrong with colonizing a concept, right? It's not like it's a natural resource or a piece of land. Ideas are not a zero-sum game. But we all have colonial mindset, no matter who we are, because our culture has colonial mindset. So we don't really need to beat ourselves up over it though, right? But you see, taking an idea out of context it's like plucking a plant out of its soil. You lose everything that made the thought work in the first place. So when we wanna use powerful new technologies such as artificial intelligence or blockchain, we want as much data as we can to help us imagine a, a positive change in the world. We do not need to throw out thousands of years of data that can fuel the next giant leaps our communities will make with technology. To proceed forward with a colonial mindset is to colonize the future. Our plans for the future need to include more data from diverse cultures and societies, and not only those ideas that, we can ser that can serve our narrow interests or flatter what we already believe. A future that includes us must be grounded in a thorough understanding of where we already are and where we have come from. So I'm gonna talk to you today about something that I call wampum code. So in my, uh, 
confederacy <laughs> in my matrilineal matriarchal confederate democracy, uh, aka the Haudenosaunee. I am, um, it's one of six nations. We actually encoded our great law of peace into a woven pattern that was woven out of purple and white shells. From that little shell you see in that image there, that is a wampum shell. Um, it is a, a beautiful clam creature that lives in the rivers. So purple and white, that's a binary system. And the wampum would be woven together after a period of deliberation as a visual representation of a complex series of contracts and agreements that resulted from community consensus-led negotiation. I'm going to read you a short statement about this from the American Indian Institute um, in New York. And so this is not my words, but I'm going to read you the statement. Before the idea of inalienable rights, liberty, and democracy were strung together in words, they were strung together in beads made of shells. In this Iroquois Confederacy wampum belt, our Hiawatha belt, it represents 1,000 years of democratic principles that we Indians shared with our newer brothers and sisters, including Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, who openly acknowledged in speeches and writings that our contribution formed the basis of the U.S. Constitution. We shared our belief that leaders should represent and serve the people, which was a startling belief in a world of kings and queens. We shared what we call the great law, which is the natural law of human dignity that precedes and underlies all other laws. Even we the people began as an ancient Indian phrase, and it's important in the pursuit of all of our happiness that we the people now means and continues to mean we, all of us who are Americans. The Iroquois Confederacy is actually the oldest living participatory democracy on earth. And the US Congress uh, memorialized this history and honored the Haudenosaunee slash Iroquois in 1988 with the adoption of the House Congress Resolution 331, which states, whereas the confederation of the original 13 colonies into one republic was influenced by the political system developed by the Iroquois Confederacy, as were many of the democratic principles which were incorporated into the constitution itself. If history was written by the victors, then the future will be written by the vectors. Artificial intelligence will radically change our world, our lives, our planet, and it remains to be seen if it will be a positive or a negative. If it's said that those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it, I would add that those who ignore data have underfitted models. When Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were looking for a new model to serve as a basis for the United States government, they were very impressed by the Iroquois Confederacy. We call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse. We're made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Thomas Jefferson spent over a year with us in upstate New York in one of our largest cities. When Jefferson and Franklin and the other founding fathers drafted the US Constitution, they cherry picked the best parts that were most beneficial to their own political purposes, the bits that seemed to align the best with their Enlightenment era ideology representation, voting, checks and balances, etc. But they left out the social and cultural networks that sustained these practices in the actual Iroquois Confederacy. Well, what do they leave out? In the Iroquois Constitution, women, clan mothers from each tribe were the only ones who could vote for the representative who was always a man, a chief. Actually, the word for clan mother and chief is the same word. There was a balance of power. Only men could serve and only women could vote. Their economy was driven through complex agricultural arrangements. Everyone in the community participated in planting and harvesting. It was not an economy of slavery dependent plantation agriculture. This is an example of colonial mindset. I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll take it. I take it and I take what will benefit my own paradigm, but I'm unconcerned with the effect it will have being taken out of context and the effect it'll have on the people I take it from. This is like trying to run a program without checking its dependencies. What if it turns out that the Confederate democracy or lasting peace and prosperity is dependent upon a balance of power along gender lines or upon a different economic model than the one practiced by European settlers in North America? Or what if it imagines a system of agriculture where the environment is protected and maintains sus sustainable practices? We all have colonial mindset just because our culture has colonial mindset. But here's the thing, we're not colonial subjects and we don't have to live under a colonial empire anymore. In data science, we talk about models suffering from either overfitting or underfitting. Overfitting is when a model exhibits a low degree of bias 
but a high degree of variance. In other words, it accepts a lot of differences within the data, but it doesn't have very much predictive power. Underfitting is the inverse of this, high bias, low variance. This is what happens when you make a generalization without enough data or when the data is not diverse enough to represent the real world. The big problem with colonial mindset is one of underfitting, extracting idea without the context that made that idea work in the first place. I'm here to say, don't colonize our future. Our plans for the future need to include more data from diverse cultures and societies and not only those ideas that flatter what we already think. For instance, let's say you want to lay the groundwork for a society run on the blockchain. What does that look like? How does that work? What are the consequences? If we don't have significant data, we might just have to wing it. But we actually have thousands of years of data about decentralized economies. The use of wampum um, among the Iroquois functioned as a decentralized distributed ledger of contracts, and it helped us govern, govern our society for centuries. Wampum is an example of what I've termed antecedent technology, and there are many more cases like this. In South America, the Inca had a Turing-complete system of knot tying called Kipu, which predated modern computing by hundreds of years. When we want to use powerful new technologies such as AI or blockchain, and we want as much data as we can to help us imagine positive change in the world, we do not need to throw out thousands of years of data that can fuel the next giant leaps our communities will make with technology. I want people to know that indigenous people had technologies that have solved complex issues. I want us to use their data to help us dream our future, and I want us to believe that just because we have had 500 years of slavery, worker exploitation, poverty, and gender imbalance, we have had thousands of years of peace, prosperity, and equality right here in the country where I'm standing right now. So part of what I created with wampum.codes um, is this framework for ethical <laughs> dependencies in software development. Um, but I also created a podcast, and that's because the wisdom that I'm speaking about when I create this ethical framework for software development, it's co-created. And um, I had planned to kind of visit all of uh, different amazing indigenous thought leaders around the country and then, you know, enter the global pandemic. And I ended up uh, turning those conversations actually into calls and then those calls into a podcast called Wampum.Code. So I'm just going to play a, a very brief intro of one of them for you. Um, Hello, welcome to Wampum.Codes. I'm your host, Amelia Winger Bearskin. Wampum.Codes is brought to you with generous support from Mozilla Foundation and the MIT Co Creation Studio. I interview indigenous and native artists, activists, technologists, coders, uh, innovators, inventors, and otherwise pretty cool people. And I will let my guest introduce herself. My name is Erica Tremblay, or Ondawayesta is my Cayuga name, and I'm super happy to be here and talk with you today. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, you're welcome to listen to them on any of the main places that you find podcasts like Spotify and Apple and all those things, or you can go to wampum.codes um, in your browser and listen there as well. Um, so, you know, there's not a universal guiding principle for indigenous people. We're very diverse. However, it is my desire to take wisdom from this inspiring group of people in these conversations and offer up a new framework for designing software ethically. So try it out and see if it unlocks something that you care about. And if it does, then I hope as a way that you'll pay it forward, you'll remember to include indigenous people in all of the meaningful projects that you do because indigenous wisdom can help solve some of the most complex issues facing the world today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what is an ethical dependency for software development. So um, I'll backtrack it a little bit, but without being you know, too boring. Um, I'm really into the idea of decentralization. And I even write a lot about decentralized storytelling and decentralized tactics um, for ethics and engaging with um, indigenous protocols and technology. So decentralized Decentralization was and is the hope of many of us early builders of the first generation of online weirdos, uh, the first children to grow up with the internet and the last generation to remember life before it existed. In those early days, we saw the internet as a real promise that it would make information free, democratize media and grant new forms of economic self-sufficiency. Many of us believe that we could change the world um, from behind our glowing screens. 
And some of us actually did that, and many things have changed, but not exactly in the way we imagined. The promise was information would be free, but what we got was that we are the free information as third parties harvest our data. The promise was a democratized media, but what we got was a media that threatens our democracy. The promise was a new economy, but what we got was the gig economy with more precarity and higher inequality. The promise of the early internet lost nearly all of its idealistic moral gravitas. And now when we talk about promises and the internet, we're usually just talking about a JavaScript concept, another best practice in a software engineer's uh, development stack. In any other field whose name has the word engineering in it, <laughs> outcomes like this wouldn't really fly. Imagine a civil engineer or a structural engineer who is tasked with building the Brooklyn Bridge. A trucking company calls them up and says, okay, we need to plan our routes across this new bridge. How many trucks, how many loads can safely go across and maintain the safety of the bridge? And the structural engineer says, hey, look, technology is neutral. I mean, I build the bridge, but I don't tell people how to use it. I mean, if someone wants to break the bridge and it falls down, I mean, it's not my fault. But, you know, software, especially social networks and the digital media ecosystem, we are perfectly okay with tech companies telling us that the systems that they have designed are neutral. And even as they break safety, democracy, privacy, fraud, make our children unsafe or are abusive or cause deep harm to our country, there is not a responsibility to know its limits, its load, or what could happen to the lives involved should it break. If we start to believe that it's not our responsibility as the builders of these systems, and I include myself, then we're really building systems of harm. We're building bridges and not caring for those who trusted us to drive across them. And I created Wampum.codes to address this issue. Like all members of the Iroquois Confederacy, we made wampum. And a lot of us have a misconception about what wampum is. A lot of people think it's a form of currency. Um, you know, it was a decentralized mean of recording contracts, something like a pre-Columbian blockchain, but it encoded not just the financial transactions, but also ethical values. And this project, Wampum.codes, is to try to reimagine how we can weave ethics back into 21st century technologies. We can embed these values as dependencies in code the same way we do with the rest of our package.json. And by implementing a decentralized protocol around ethics and AI software, we can make a step in the right direction. We live our lives according to a moral code and the time has come for us to code our morals. And that's the end of my part about wampum. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about virtual reality. I like virtual reality because I think of it as a dream technology. Um, a couple times when I had user testing on some of my virtual reality pieces, some of my really dear friends would, you know, see it at an early preview at a museum or a film festival and then I'd see them again like six months later at another you know art event or a museum or something and they'd be talking to someone and they would say yeah I had this dream where you know my hands were feet and then they say oh wait a minute actually that was that was your VR piece wasn't it and I started noticing that it is very true that VR is like a dream technology because you're walking without walking, you're communing with people without communing with them, you're touching things without touching things and it's always been my like, you know, total fantasy to imagine that I could invite people into my dream world because I have really vivid, lucid dreams, and I always wish I could just invite a friend to like experience it with me. And um, virtual reality really makes that possible, which is uh, pretty fun. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of VR projects that I made because um, I heard a lot of you uh, awesome uh, students and community members are are creating your own. Uh, amazing immersive and VR experiences. So I was approached by um, this producer and actress, Alicia Rayner, uh, famous for uh, her performances in Orange is the New Black. And she was producing and starring in a film called Egg. And Egg was about an artist. And her best friend was played by Christina Hendricks from Mad Men. And, and she was like, there's a scene where I am this artist and I give um, you know, this other actress, a VR headset, and she experiences this artwork that me, the artist, has made. But I wanted it actually to be based on, like, a real artist, and I thought it was really cool if we had an actual art piece that would be made, and we would represent it in the film, and then when we showed it at film festivals, people could interact with the VR experience and also see the film, so that it would be sort of like life um, mirroring this fictional world. And I was really intrigued by that. And so I created this project, um, Your Hand our feet, uh, the virtual reality experience, and I'm going to play a little video uh, that Engadget Media uh, made about that. Oh. 
there is that really crazy sound effect when the giant's leg gets shaved. That's this really strange sponge that I bought that's the worst sponge ever. Like, it's so bad at scrubbing dishes. And we sat there and we were listening to it and we were like, this is, this is the sound of shaving a giant's leg. This is perfect. I started out kind of my creative career as a writer and I was I was really interested in kind of experimental writing that leverage different um, aspects of new technologies. So I got to this point where I was like, it's really fun to think about technology and how it's impacting us, but I would really rather be working directly with the technologies. I went to a grad program called ITP and I learned how to code. In my last year of grad school, VR suddenly came onto the scene as like, something that was going to be accessible for us to use. You know, Sarah was the first person I had met as an artist who was just working in VR in a more playful way. We just started brainstorming and thinking of moments when you virtually give someone a piece of your life, like in, in daily life. If I'm talking to Sarah and I'm trying to explain to her how I felt that morning or what I was thinking about the future, very frequently we prototype those kinds of experiences with sayings or with metaphors. So I can say like, I walked into that room and my stomach just dropped, or it was so like loud that I felt like my ears were bleeding. Your Hands or Feet is a VR experience. It's an interactive exploration of new metaphors. The experience starts off where you're in kind of this surreal looking kitchen and you have in front of you a half dozen carton of eggs and inside of each egg is contained an experience that has some kind of psychologically complex action to it that we hope acts as something that you think back on and you're like, wow, this is such a strange feeling. It kind of reminds me of, for instance, like that time that I felt like my hands were feet. I don't know, I feel like my mind is a confusing machine. What we're really doing here is we're creating these metaphors that like maybe don't exist, but might apply in a situation as like the perfect way to describe this thing. In the beginning, I started with a basic treatment. So I created a lot of 3D assets to just sort of mock up this world, sort of the look and feel. And we came up with this idea of having it be like a half dozen experiences from you know a half egg carton and how we would move from each each space landing on the visuals for any project is an interesting process you know you have to make something that feels true to something that you like but it also has to be something true to what the other person likes Sarah said she had this amazing friend, Neve Bavarsky, in LA, who was an uh, illustrator. We reached out to Neve and, you know, showed him all of the reference imagery, showed him our very tight color palette of what we were trying to go for. And we were like, can you do the Neve version of your hands or feet universe? And then from there, um, we were like, how are we going to put this thing together? Because translating from 2D into 3D seems easy, but to keep the same visual style is not always so straightforward. It made a lot of sense like for us to approach it with a style that's inviting and not like depressing or scary, but just a little bit scary, maybe. It's really helpful to like take those two concepts and then give it to one person that can execute that so that it stays really consistent. So we were like, let's try this tool, Medium, which is a 3D um, VR sculpting tool. And so we felt like, oh, this is perfect that we found this, this way to find like a slice of what we were interested in, a way that we can produce it in a really organic and fun way. And that's kind of how we landed on the visual style that we're at right now. A lot of our music is gonna be generative. So generative music is when you're really designing those whys, therefores, and ifs. You know, normally you listen to a song and it's got the beginning and the middle of the end and there's like nothing you can do about it. But in an interactive song, there's ways that you can alter parts of it so that way you're sort of participating with the music. Every object that you pick up is like contains an audio track. Depending on which objects you interact with, you're really flushing out what the soundscape of that environment is. 
Me and Sarah are doing all this work to create a really fun playground. We might have kind of serious concepts about the emotional resonance behind each of the interactions, which we have very long and engaged conversations about, like even the, the physicality of grabbing that object, to, that action has to be connected. So we want each of the interactions to also be analogous to a place in time that you might have had that feeling. When I look at it from an outside perspective, I'm like, a lot of these things have to do with frustration, but a lot of them also have to do with joy and feeling joy while doing something frustrating. And so I want to give people a moment where they can interact with that quality of VR, where they can say, this is an extension of my brain and my experience within the world. This isn't the real world. This is the computational amalgamation of human understanding in this world. And I want to give people an opportunity to interact with that and interface with that. When we explain it to people, they just get it and they're excited about it, even though it's like, oh, it's like an experience where your hands are feet because don't you ever just feel like a weird feeling and you don't know how to describe it and it's like something you've never felt before. Well, isn't VR the perfect way to kind of explore that? And people are like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so that's been pretty surprising also. So um, another fun VR project that I really enjoyed um, was I, I was always very obsessed with uh, different simulations and ways that you can build cities in virtual space. And I was approached by this incredible man, a city planner in New York City who had been a city planner with you know Jane Jacobs for 30 years and um, something really different outside of my experience as a technologist and an artist. And he was interested in, in building something in the downtown of New Rochelle. And if you don't know where New Rochelle is, it's um, north of the Bronx. It actually used to be a part of the Bronx in New York City. And and, um, you know, he was he was thinking of making it like a traditional artist district, um, but uh, the downtown had never really had, um, you know, like a, an artist district. And it was so close to Manhattan. And we were kind of talking about the ways in which art can be something that uh, becomes a catalyst for the community to to be empowered and to speak to each other and becomes a means of care and co-creation. And, you know, my background is technology. And so I. I was looking at ways in which we could use technology to empower citizens to to be like city planners, right? Like that would be my dream if I could just use city Sim City, but for real though. That's what I said to him, and he's like, "I don't understand what you're saying, but like, you know, write it into a proposal. Let me see." So, um, so then I began my journey of, of three years working with him and and creating this project. Um, for the Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge, which uh, five cities in America were chosen as these champions for this project based on these proposals where we wanted to use technology in creative ways that could make a real lasting impact for citizens. Um, and our idea was to create a, a toolkit for citizens to co-design their city with city planners using AR and VR technologies. And in this way, we could give people the experience and understand trade-offs so that they could make decisions of how they wanted to experience the built environment and communicate on an even playing field um, with the architects and builders um, of their city. Another project that I really enjoyed was called Monsters, and it is in collaboration with another amazing Portland resident, Wendy Redstar. And we created, um, you know, we got this incredible research camera. I was a Google Jump fellow, and so I said, I got this crazy camera, let's make something. And we had this idea since in um, our respective uh, indigenous communities, she's Crow from Montana, outside of Billings. I My uh, ancestral lands are in like upstate New York, Canada, nor northeastern region um, of the United States. And we, but yet, even though like geographically our um our ancestors were from very different um locations and our families um lived on very different reservations we both had these stories about a monster called the little people and we were interested like hey can we tell these stories of these little people and then maybe ha use ar and vr to have people experience the land and these stories um but as we began our pro process of interviewing elders to in order to find out more about these stories and about their connection to the land um um, we actually learned that the keepers of the 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 word little people in Crow actually meant the keepers of the land. And we started realizing that many of the elders who kept these stories were also the champions of protecting the sovereignty, the rights, and the land in all these indigenous spaces. So we began to see that monsters 
and your relationship to them is really dependent on, um, I guess you could think of it like my dog, if it's protecting me in my house and it makes a really fierce growl, I'm not scared. I'm pretty excited that it's protecting me, right? But if you're on the other side of my front door, you may hear it growl and feel very afraid. And so we actually wanted to invite our viewers to become monsters with us and to become protectors of the land. Um, so here is a, a video, which is from my cell phone, of the installation of this work at the Newark Museum um, in New Jersey. And this is like a sweat lodge, which you might see traditionally, um, you know, like uh, maybe on Wendy's reservation, she built this beautiful sweat lodge. Um, and inside of it, you actually have the 360 projection of the outside, the videos that we took uh, using that research camera. Um, and once you get inside of this space, it becomes a story space. Like we, we, we couldn't kind of help but tell the stories as we went into the space and the audience would come and sit down with us. And I mean, they would just kind of start rolling. You know, it was felt very much like that blanket fort where you are holding a flashlight under your face and telling stories to your friends. Um, and I like the idea of playing with that type of space, um, those cozy spaces and inviting people to think about being monsters with us. Um, I really love that piece. There it is. <laughs> um, I have another project that I'm working on currently that's called Sky World, Cloud World. And um, I'm creating a project with called Honor Native Sky, which is a chat-based protocol via SMS. So you could think of that as a chatbot, which can serve as a conversational means of teaching about honoring native land. This project is part of a larger art project I've called Sky World, Cloud World, where I'm examining the sacred nature of our cloud-based communications. Sky World and Cloud World tries to understand the cloud as both a spiritual place and a vehicle for the ephemeral way in which we choose to communicate with our kin over distance and time. This concept of the cloud in web-based applications has interrupted our notion of a sky world or a cloud world, which is the grand connective tissue all humans have with one another. We must maintain and honor our sky world and our cloud world, the layer of sky which protects our world, maintains our atmosphere, and which has given us the ability to communicate through invisible signals, through satellites, tubes, and more importantly, through dreams and imagination. This project is a live performance installation, sound works, and a chat interface and writings to connect climate justice activism with communications and indigenous technologies. And I mentioned that part of what I'm creating is for a group called Honor Native Land. So if you go to the usdac.us slash native land, you can learn about uh, the Honor Native Land project. Um, an interesting thing that they have created, and I'm, I say that they have created, because there's only two of us now. <laughs> there's my amazing boss, Jacqueline uh, Roussel, and, and myself. But before I joined, um, she really was the custodian of this project. And so I'm going to read you some of her words. And they're her words that were generated out of many conversations she had with hundreds of land defenders across Turtle Island. So, um, you know, she is really the custodian of these words, but not the sole creator. And I'm very new, uh, the newest kid on this block. So I, I really want to honor her and bring her into the space. So I would like to read to you why she says, or why it's said in our Honor Native Land Toolkit, which you can download at for free at that link, um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more around land acknowledgements. Um, so, so it said, why do we introduce the practice of land acknowledgement? Uh, well, we do it to offer recognition and respect, to counter the doctrine of discovery with the true story of the people who were already here, to create a broader public awareness of the history that has led us to this moment, to begin to repair relationships with Native communities and with the land, to support larger truth-telling and reconciliation efforts, to remind people that colonization is an ongoing process with Native lands still occupied due to deceptive and broken treaties, to take a cue from indigenous protocol, opening up a space with reverence and respect, to inspire ongoing action and relationship. Acknowledgement by itself is a small gesture. It becomes meaningful when coupled with authentic relationship and informed action. But this beginning can be an opening to greater public consciousness of native sovereignty and cultural rights, a step towards equitable relationship and reconciliation. 
And this virtual resource kit is at that link. And we also host workshops and curriculum and webinars and more to advance understanding and adoption in honoring native land. So if um, you are ever want to share that with a friend, I highly recommend it. It's, an, it's a really beautiful group. Um, another project that I created, um, and I'm just kind of like looking at time here. Um, Maybe I'll just go through this really fast. This was um, a public art piece that I worked with with Four Freedoms for, called the Hashtag 2020 Awakening. You might have read about us in the New York Times. Um, they were also known as the Wide Awake Movement. It's kind of connected to Four Freedoms. And we created these billboards that we put up all around uh, Turtle Island. And um, they were an artist would think of a question and the question would be on the billboard so i created two questions for my billboard um this one is in alaska and it says what is made bright by the lost of your light and the other one that i created is who benefits from your burnout and so i'm going to read you like a little statement that i wrote for the guardian when they asked about this project because i think that is kind of encapsulates my feelings about this project during the global pandemic an increasingly contentious political landscape and the surge of energy from rededicating ourselves to racial justice in America. I've witnessed my incredible peers balance fear, bravery, a commitment to family and to local and global communities of underrepresented people. I've seen them create art in response and build new systems of support. But among my friends, especially my female identifying friends, and especially those of us who are mothers, many of us are being asked to do the undoable daily. I wanted a message to remind the world that through change making, we can't let ourselves become kindling. I don't want us to burn out. All the crises in the world today are asking us to run more and more current through the little filaments of our minds and souls. But when those go out, does it leave the world a brighter place? Of course it doesn't. The social, economic, physical, political, intellectual demands of a movement must bring with it the great care for and value of each human being who is a part of it. And here are some photographs of uh, these billboards also um, in smaller video billboards in Times Square and at the Chinese Theater, which is in Los Angeles and the Anchorage Museum uh, in Alaska. Uh, a project that I got to do a couple months ago was in collaboration with um, the National Ecological um, Education Association um, for the National Public Lands Day, which is a day when all public lands that are in the national parks as well as all publicly accessible lands become free and open for people to experience them and we created a virtual event for this and you can view it at the swamp dot live um, and the reason why I, I'm sharing that with you is because I had this really wonderful conversation with our nation's first architect for climate change and he he really blew my mind um, and I'd, I'd love it if you go and check it out at the swamp dot live and you can kind of listen to our conversation as well as some of the other pieces that we have in the show um, where he's talking about really practical um, movements and and um, ideas and thoughts and and actions that you, that he's thinking of as part of the National Park Service um, around what preservation means because in a world that is going to be defined um, you know and changed uh, really drastically over the next few years and the next few decades uh, preservation becomes something that with radical thought um, can really intersect with technology so he talks a lot about the use of lidar and virtual reality um, and other types of data sets as a way of um, understanding the spaces that we're about to lose um, and I don't know it just really touched me so I highly recommend recommend checking out that conversation. I really liked what he had to say and some of the ideas. I think um, for those of you who are interested in, um, you know, climate change, climate justice, and that virtual space that could be interesting to you. Um, something else I, I would like to share with you is no-funding.com, which is a creative collective. So it is a mutual aid network that aims to help creatives radically rethink our relationships to funding grants and gatekeepers. Uh, no funding, be the crypto anarchist digital artist collective you wanna see in the world. And anyone is welcome to join. You can go to that link and join. It is an arts and media, in an arts and media culture increasingly focused on securing patronage from institutions, corporations, and wealthy individuals. No funding asks what creative life would look like if artists were fully liberated from money and the self-censorship imposed by its pursuit. Rather than experience the soul-crushing lifestyle of striving, rejection, and constant jockeying for position, could we instead find new ways to support one another? What would we make? 
Um, no Funding is a public group. You can visit no-funding.com to get in on the fun and participate in weekly online conversations where members present on topics near and dear to them. No Funding is primarily a BIPOC creative technologist community, but it is open to anyone who has needed a day job to make something cool that they believe in. Our motto is no striving, no hustling, no funding is a creative collective. <laughs> All right, so if you remember from the beginning, which was a very long time ago now, I told you there were going to be topic roundup screens. <laughs> so this is my first topic roundup screen. Um, this is where you take a screenshot or you need to pull out your cell phone or I don't know, maybe you could process it on 35 millimeter camera even. Um, anyways, these are the topics that I talked about. And so this is that way you can do that shorthand notation to remember some of these ideas, Google them later. I'm listing a lot of the organizations that I talked about or who support me um, or who I mentioned who are collaborators in these projects. So giving you a couple seconds to take that screenshot. And then the next slide um, that I have is my personal details. So if you would like to, you know, follow, 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 engage, 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 interact, 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 you can do that at these links. And um, you can also join no-funding.com. And um, I'll give you just one last second to take a photo of that. And then with that, I, I adjourn and I will say nyawe eskeno and daniho. I've spoken. Thank you. So I don't know if we're going to do questions or anything like that. Uh, oh, hello. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay, great. I think there's a delay. I'm going to see if anyone has a question and then I'll recommunicate it to you. Sounds good. They're coming right now. Hi. Hello. Hello. Okay. I think everything's working. My name is Nana. My name is Nana. And it's it's feeding back. Hold on. If it's easier, um, you're welcome to type it in the chat too. I'm not sure if that's easier. Amelia, I think yes. Hannah has a question. Okay. Excellent. Okay, you can hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I'm curious, like how you, a basic question, basically trying to funnel it down without getting too detailed. How do you relate environment and resource extraction with technology and navigate that and think about that? It's been on my mind a lot lately with Southeast Oregon and Nevada and the Thacker Pass being so much happening there with a large lithium mine about to go in and that largely fuels technology development um it's a really big question but i'm curious what your thoughts on it are thank you for that question and um i think i guess i would say i have i have two ways of thinking about that i mean i probably have more than two but i'll talk about two um and the first is that that's partially why i connect technology to be um, part of something that is multi-generational and that has been around for thousands of years. And it has practices and we have had practices before uh, colonization and, and we continue to have those practices that connect technology to our values and to honoring our native land for the generations to come and honoring the generations behind us. So if we think about technology that way, then it's not like there is only one type of technology and that technology has to be extracted. The second way that I think about it is we have yet to see um, this modern era of computational technology that's maybe, you know, in a, and it's, I can't even say in a post Turing world because the Inca had a Turing complete data system of, um, of data manipulation, engineering, visualization, and um, and use of large scale data infrastructure using knot tying. And knots um, don't really take any energy except the human body to tie them. 
Um, and so we have and can have complex data structures and systems using the human mind and then using any type of object-oriented programming that we'd like. And it doesn't have to be with lithium, right? And if we had our values centered around uh, protecting our environment and protecting our Earth, you would see that we can actually make computers out of many different things, as we have in the history of computers as well. It used to be glass and oxygen. Uh, we would use carbon and we would use fire. Um, and that's actually not a million years ago. That was like for the Apollo 9, right? So we used uh, copper and gold. So there, are, there have been and there always will be new ways in which we can use technology. But if our values are centered on um, maintaining and protecting our environment, you'll find that our data systems could look very different. They could look like something that is made of tying knots that could biodegrade. They could be something. And actually, you know, Kipu, because I keep using that that notion of the tying knots, it's actually, it's Turing complete, which means you can do any operational function you would do in any um, Turing complete pro programmatic language like Python or or anything like that. You can do that in Kipu. So um, you don't need a computer to run a Python script on data. You could use a knot, right? And I know it kind of like blows our mind because we're really distanced and thinking that technology Technology has to be a screen or has to have a, a battery or that processing power is understood in a different way. Um, so I think I don't I don't see that there is a duplicitous nature in being someone who's interested in technology, but pushing for us to understand that technology should maintain um, harmony with our our environment and that we should be thinking now um, of how to use technology to um, pr to protect our sacred earth. Thank you so much, Thank Amelia. Um, is there, are there any other questions in the room? Come on up. Can you mic? Yep. Hi, I'm Noah. Hi, uh, Noah. Do you think any, uh, do you think art made in virtual reality be, is non-perishable or? Has a made I love that. I love that phrase. I love that. I love that. Sorry, I'm beating back. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No, um, I love that phrase of non-perishable. I'm sorry. I wish I could have had you explain a little bit more about that. But art and virtual reality being non-perishable, I really love that phrase. I, I think you should make a ton of work about it. It's beautiful. Um, you know, a lot of technology that I worked with in virtual reality in the late '90s. Um, I think of it as perishable because I'm like, oh, wow, I made that on some kind of system. I don't even know how I would play that anymore. It, like was on some outdated console using a Game Boy Advance and like weird LED screens I got in Chinatown. I don't know. But as I'm saying that, um, I remember a lot of um, projects that some of my fellow artists have made. Uh, from earlier parts of their career are finding new ways of, of being able to interface with those um, those microchips that they worked with in the earlier part of their lives. Um, and I also really like that the Library of Congress um, in DC has a very interesting way of archiving software and software artifacts and artists artifacts that were in interactive media or just other like they are, they are really into archiving and it's really fascinating to me all the ways in which they archive and I was talking to them um, when I uh, was part of this project called Playtest that Tahir Hempmill uh, produced we're getting artists to kind of talk to these librarians about the concept of a digital archive and um, they're at the vanguard of this um, but even then, I think artists and a lot of young people like yourself have a lot of insight to give them around what is a way of, um, of, of archiving these experiences that we're creating that maybe are meant to be very esoteric or ephemeral. Um, and I thought of different ways that they would have to explain what a computer and operating system was in not even very many years, like even in 20 years, our understanding of why someone used a computer or what the other types of implications of it were would become important to that archive. Um, that it might be like, hey, this was made out of um, 
something like lithium that doesn't exist on the planet anymore, right? And like you can't play it anymore because it existed in an extractive landscape that looked like this. And then you'd have to explain that as the metadata to the software, right? So I, I kind of love thinking about future technologies in that way um, of how we would communicate them to seven generations in the future. And then we really need to go to the core again of why we're making the thing, not just what we wanted people to experience, from it and the kind of ecosystem of values that it needs to have as its ethical dependencies in order to live in the world. If it's a plant and in the plant needs water, you need to explain the water too, right? And I think that's the ethics involved. Thank you for that question, Noah. Thank you so much. Do we have another question in the room? Come on up. Hi, uh, my name is Will, um, and the question I have for you, I guess, um, sometimes it seems like the way computer science is taught um, in like this current educational climate that we have, uh, it seems like the way that it's taught creates this knowledge class. Um, and I'm wondering if you encounter that uh, divide and the access um, your audiences have to understanding some of the stuff you wish to talk about. I'm wondering if you encounter that in your work and how you go about dealing with that. Thank you so much, Will, for that question. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm just sorry, I forget about the feedback. Thank you for that question, Will. Um, I love being a bridge. I talk about bridges a little bit in the beginning of my talk, but I love being a bridge where I take artistic concepts and I turn them into coding concepts so that people who are from a software engineer background or a technical background can begin to understand some of the really uh, valuable ideas that have been created in a more artistic, creative, theory, saturated universe that that um, that I'm a part of, too, uh, because I think they they would really um, be able to grow and understand the world in a way that maybe isn't part of their um, their education or their own lived experience. But we as artists have created tools that are very valuable and important for them to understand how the decisions that they make have real impact in the world. Um, and then I also like to be a translator to, um, to creatives around uh, technology and not just to like demystify or educate, but because there are actually really interesting I would say spiritual truths in code as well. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting theoretical frameworks and concepts that again, artists I think could be nourished by in their own practice. Um, and I like to just be that translator between the two of them. Um, and so, and I, you know, I think when you talk about like a knowledge class, I think both of our industries have that problem. <laughs> like for sure the, the tech, uh, class and the tech worker class is a specific class and I think you're really engaging with it in a way in Portland um, and Northern California in a way that no one else in the world really is right? and um, you know as like a native native New Yorker um, I, I can see that like as a as a person who's who's lived in uh, you know in the San Francisco Bay Area um, it, it's it's wild right like the you you're kind of experiencing um, that in a heightened way that maybe the rest of the world will experience at some time or maybe they won't and you just have that like really heightened experience but I as a New Yorker a native New Yorker um, I see that in the art world too that there is a, like a knowledge class and a real separation sometimes with the real world with the working class with um, people who are really enmeshed or immersed in the in the things that artists often uh, critique or create so I think that both of them actually have a very similar problem which is being very disconnected from um, from uh, the lived experience of a lot of diverse humans on Tur Turtle Island. And so I think it's very important for both of them to really understand uh, the lived experience of um, people who don't have um, as much power, because each of you have a lot of different types of power. And um, that means that if you worked t you know, together, I think you can offer solutions if you allow um, others to lead and to teach you as well. And I think that needs to come from the lived experience of diverse people. Thank you for that question, Will. Thank you, Amelia. Um, Thank you, Amelia. Other questions? Got another question coming. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Sky. Thanks so much um, for the array of projects and variety of technologies. And I am wondering, you spoke about your New Rochelle project and having community 
you know, kind of use um, VR and perhaps AR to even the playing field you said for urban planning and, you know, communities. And you showed like one image that showed that you were doing some kind of participatory engagement beforehand. I'm wondering if you can speak to the prep work behind, you know, before you kind of create these amazing projects, make them available to people. And I assume you synthesize them afterwards, but how do you, what input and how much of that prep work goes into the participatory engagement before you begin these, um, the, the making aspect of it? Thanks. Thank you so much, Sky. That's Thank a wonderful so question. That's a wonderful question. So luckily, you know, um, I, 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 I know that I'm not the, the smartest person in, and I shouldn't be the smartest person in any team that I build, right? And I had this wonderful, uh, you know, city planner, Ralph, who was part of it, and another woman who was the head of the, um, she, I mean, she did a lot of things. She was kind of worked as an executive in the business improvement district. But one of the things that she had a background was creating a, um, an open air market in the library park. Um, and it was a farm, you know, like a farmer's market, but it had, it was like more than a farmer's market, you know, had all these cool kid engagements with the library and, you know, these classes and education. So she had already been building that for about a year and she was, um, you know, an executive on my project. And, um, she was really, she thought the library is a really great place of getting engagement. And she t explained to me what a traditional charrette was that she had often done for, as part of city planning. And we really dissected what, what she had done, what city planners had done, what um, architectural groups or um, developers had done. And, and, you know, and we all felt like none of them were actually very good, right? Like, and for many different reasons, right? Like the developers come in and they do these charrettes where they pay like 15 people and no one even knows how they find these 50 people. They find 15 people, they pay them a small amount of money. They have them kind of play with Legos and talk about their perfect city. And then they say, oh, that's great. Cause that's what we already planned to do. <laughs> and then they're like, we're done, you know, like this is the city you get, right? And then they cite that as like, oh, we talk to citizens all over and they all want this and this and this and it happens to be the exact same thing that they've built in 20 different cities, right? So that's like really problematic. And then we were like, okay, well, what does the city do to sort of counteract that? Because that's like kind of a marketing campaign from somebody who wants millions of dollars, you know what I mean, right? So they were like, well, what we do is we have these public sessions where we announce them a month in advance um, through the like a local newspaper and then people show up and they can come on the microphone and they can say, uh, this is what we think about the the proposal. OK. Um, and that's it. Right. And so we said, well, do you have any data from those meetings? And they said we've recorded every single one of them. <laughs> Which is like amazing. So me and my poor assistants, my, my amazing writing team of like, you know, philosophers, rhetoric majors, data scientists, AI professionals, <laughs> like we watch all of these videos. And we started creating a matrices on how to analyze them as each person who comes up to the mic. And we this is the rubric that I created was each person that comes up to the mic, do they say something that is timely? Do they say something that is actionable? And do they say something that's relevant? That's it. Yes or no. Okay. So, okay. We're building a cell phone tower. Does anyone have any um, things that they'd like to say about that? And the first come person comes up and says, well, actually there's a flood in my neighborhood. Okay. Well, that is not relevant to the current thing that's on the floor to be voted for. Right. Is it timely? Well, it is timely if it was about flooding. Right. And then is it actionable? Well, we actually won't be able to bring that to an accord tonight, but we can put it on the docket like for the future, right? So that one's kind of like a no on all three of those. And sometimes someone would come up and say something that was highly relevant. Like they would say, actually that cell phone tower is causing an enormous amount of problem in my neighborhood. And people have said that they're not feeling well and they think that you know it might have something to do with that. And they're kind of talking through all these things. And, and then you look and you say, well, this is the final uh, one that we're doing and actually it's already going to be built and we can't vote on it because this is this is the one we're just ratifying what we already said in the last like seven months so it's not timely and it's not actionable it's highly relevant maybe they should look into it the problems that people are bringing up but it's no longer actionable and it's no longer timely so with that rubric we decided that if we could create something that made movement on those three axes that it would be an improvement if we could get higher engagement numbers, so the amount of people that ever showed up to these meetings never broke 17. We never had more than 17 people in any one of those meetings in the last, I guess, like six and a half years, right? Never more than 17 at any single one. 
So we're like, if we could get more than 17 people, that's movement and positive. And if we could get higher numbers on those three matrices, that's improvement, right? Like if th- people say things that are relevant, timely, and actionable about city planning that could actually make a difference. And then we created this charrette and we put it at the farmer's market, which had hundreds of people. So we got hundreds of people to engage and tell us their information that was, and we made sure that we created a system in AR and VR that was timely that was actionable and that was relevant. And then that's how we kind of began to create our toolkit. So that is a a little bit of the preparation. There is a lot more than that, but um, that's just kind of a window into how you can begin to think about um, uh, measuring your own impact within the community. Thank you for that question, Sky. Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you so much, Amelia. Thank you so much, Amelia. All right. Thank you so much, Amelia, for your sharing your work and all of your incredible projects. Um, we've really enjoyed having you. One day we'd love to have you come in person um, and visit us here in Portland. Um, I'm going to attempt to turn the computer around if I can. It's very held down by wires so that you can see the, uh, the students in the audience. And everyone, uh, please join me in giving Amelia a round of applause. And thanks to everyone who's joined us virtually. Uh, We have two more events uh, coming up tomorrow. Uh, We have a workshop with Make Think Code um, at 2 p.m. And then at 5 p.m. we have uh, Mashinka Faroon's Hakopian's keynote. So we hope you all can join us then. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. (laughs) Thank you so much. And I would love to come back to PNCA anytime. Every time I've been, it's been a joy. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Amelia.